Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Limode and today on Hot Limode we are coming to you with your monthly fashion review from the year of December 2020, which seems really weird. I never thought 2020 would end, but thank God it has. Although as of right now, 2021 has already been a hot goddamn mess. But as we mentioned, we are going to be doing our December 2020 roast, looking at all of the outfits and looks from your favorite celebrities and what they wore during the month of December. Now there is going to be a channel membership version, which has a longer and larger amount of images and celebrity looks to discuss. So you can check that out if you're a channel member. If you're not, become one, and this video still will suffice though, so don't worry about it. So with that, let's get into it. First up is Anya Taylor-Joy. Some of you may know her from 2020's Emma, which was a take on a Jane Austen novel. Bridgerton should have taught me more about the Regency period, but like, <laughs> she is wearing a Victor and Rolf look. Now you guys will probably remember the No Photos Please dress from Victor and Rolf's Haute Couture collection that was based on memes. But here, this dress is actually not the haute couture runway dress. This is more of like a commercial version that I believe Victor and Rolf is still selling. Now, I believe that Anya is a sort of face of Victor and Rolf's fragrance and cosmetic line. So that might be why she's wearing this dress and holding a low-key spawn con little makeup satchel. But honestly, I really like the dress. I still think it's very, very fun. And I don't think that when a brand does something that is kind of iconic and then sort of reinterprets it a lot is necessarily like a bad thing. I mean, I'm literally wearing a Marine Sair Crescent Moon and I think that she's done a great job of recreating those styles to fit different collections within her whole realm and sphere and aesthetic of Marine Sair. Ism. So honestly, recreating those pieces in more affordable styles makes a lot of sense to me. Honestly, I do think that the pastel -y sort of mint green and the sheer sort of purple sleeves definitely play off of each other well. And I do like the fact that underneath whatever this sheer dress is, there's a green little bra top, which I think is perfect. It matches the skirt. It makes a lot of sense. And yet you can still see the no photos please very, very clearly. So honestly, as far as spawn con goes, I don't hate this. Next up was Cardi B on the cover of Billboard magazine. Now Billboard has been doing a lot of cute little photo shoots and this one has Cardi B wearing a sky high Schiaparelli gown. Now this sort of putting celebrities on stilts style has been around for a little bit. I do think we recently saw Valentino doing an haute couture style where there were stilts, but I do remember it most vividly when Zendaya was on the cover of Garage Magazine wearing that crazy raffia gigantic skirt. It was really, really beautiful. It's probably one of the great images of the 21st century so far, styled by Gabriella Carifa Johnson, who, if you do not know, is one of the best image makers currently working, and I've said it, so it's fact. I do like that this sort of style is continuing on and on and on, but let's talk about this Cardi look. So it's a tailored jacket, which we've seen quite a lot from Daniel Roseberry's Scaparelli, and it does have that sort of like cloud-like silky fabric that reaches around the head, which we've seen during many of Daniel Roseberry's haute couture collections and on a lot of celebrities as well. And honestly, the skirt, which is like a weird sort of mermaid style skirt, cause at the knee, which I presume is Cardi's knee, it like tapers down and then falls out, which is the biggest mermaid style skirt I've ever seen in my life. It does have descending jewels that fall all the way down, which again, is another classic of Daniel Roseberry's Scaparelli. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily like Elsa Scaparelli, but the jewelry and like the crazy eyewear and the earrings and the, you know, embroidery all over pieces is what Daniel has really pushed forward. And I guess that in this case, it's being pushed forward here as well. Overall, I do think that it captures the Daniel Roseberry Scaparelli essence very well. It's very noticeable. It's very easily discernible who it is and, you know, the elements of the brand under DR. I'm not saying Daniel Roseberry again. And honestly, it's a fun shoot. Happy to see it. I like Cardi and Scaparelli. Next up is Chris Lee and she is wearing Balenciaga. They're these crazy pagoda shoulders. They are so dramatic and I love them. I do love the movement in this green and black polka dot dress. It's giving me very much so York peppermint patty and I'm enjoying it, although I don't actually enjoy York peppermint patties. I do think it's really fun. Listen, it's a very hard shape 
with Dimna's work because it is very stiff. I do love the way that the arm movement is going. I do think it shows that the pleats are there. They're really, really beautiful. I do think the colors are kind of striking. I am wondering though, it's not actually a dress because we can see that the top sort of falls and it's a different shade than the skirt, which I think is really interesting. Why would you not just produce the skirt in the same shade as the top? Also the fun little bow detail at the top is like kind of cuties and I'm kind of sold on it and I'm kind of about it. It's very Boy Scout, but like that kind of Boy Scout, you know what I mean? I, I was that kind of Boy Scout. But honestly, it's a really fun risk. I enjoy it. I think it's definitely very sculptural. I think it definitely has elements of Cristobal Balenciaga in it. And I think it's a nice little channeling of the house's founder by Dimna. Next up is Dixie D'Amelio in Valentino, which like I wasn't really expecting this V Magazine shoot to put Dixie in a great light, but like this is fashion moment I have been waiting for from these TikTok people. Like the TikTokers, need to get it together. They need somebody to say, you look a hot goddamn mess. You can't wear sweatpants every day. Like you can wear sweatpants a lot. I normally wear sweatpants, but not every day. And this shoot, I think is a great shoot. I really do. I think it's a fantastic shoot. This was done by Nicola Formichetti, who is a stylist and fashion director to Lady Gaga. And in a weird way, he almost took Dixie, who is this very sort of, relatable celebrity in that sense took her in a direction that is a lot less relatable and a lot more of a totally different aesthetic than we normally see her in. Like I understand she sings a lot about sadness and I feel like that maybe is playing into this sort of style. So we have a sort of darkened Valentino heavily printed dress, which when we look at it from the resort lookbook, you can see the total contrast of how the light hits this dress and how it totally changes it, which I think it's actually really, really exciting because I love the darkness of this burgundy. I like the harshness of this green. I like the prints all over. It's ridiculous. It's over the top. It's ugh, in your face. I don't know what she's holding. It's giving me gothic and it's giving me gothic in the sense of like the mall goth, but also like the historical goths that like took over multiple parts of Europe. And I kind of like it. I like where it's going. I do think that it really does have an energy about it that is different. And that's what I like to see in an editorial. You don't always have to present the celebrity in the same light they're usually presented in. Like give them a story, give them something to act in, give them something to present themselves in that's new and different and a different tone because that might actually reach different people. And I feel like this is a great example of that. Dixie letting somebody take her image and her sort of aesthetic, which is like sad, you know, one day, one day, and giving it a sort of fashion story and a fashion element behind it. And that's what needs to happen. Not just with the TikTok people, with everybody. Everybody needs to allow these sorts of people, these artists, these visionaries, to mold them in these settings to give it something interesting to look at. Because otherwise we don't get iconic imagery like we used to. We're still on a Valentino kick because we're talking about Dua Lipa, Dua Lipa wearing Valentino. She looks great. She does. She looks wonderful. She looks stunning. She looks radiant. The ostrich feather hat. Still in effect, one of the best Haute Couture collections that Pier Paolo ever produced. It came back with the most recent Haute Couture collection, which was in that all white, beautiful, stunning, ridiculous, stilted experience. And I think Dua looks great. I feel like she's really putting in the effort. Her stylist Lorenzo is also like really putting in the effort and I'm so happy about it. I think it's wonderful. This dress is gorgeous. I love that she's standing up on a little platform and there's a little slit. And normally I don't like a slit at all. It's disgusting, it's gross. They're usually terrible. But here, we're getting an Angelina Jolie thigh and leg moment. And then the dress sort of fans out beautifully and like drapes itself on the platform. And then she's wearing this hat, which is just ridiculous and over the top and avant-garde and like beautiful and luxurious and gorgeous. And that's what, that's, that's what we need. This is what we need to see. Listen, I understand Dua Lipa does a lot of performance where, and normally she's in, you know, a Mugler moment or she's in something that's a little bit less exciting. But when she's doing stagnant work, I think this is a great example of you can actually make somebody look really exciting and like a little fashion image on a stage. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. Claps to Dua, claps to her stylist, claps to Valentino, claps to everybody because this is, this is a moment and I'm very happy about it. Next up is Gal Gadot wearing Pateau, which is a fun rhymey 
scheme. Honestly, Pateau, Jean Pateau, was a designer that was really big in the 1920s and I think 1930s, and sort of was in that sportswear world at the same time as Coco Chanel and sort of helped to usher in the idea of like sportswear being something that women could wear at that point. I don't really get the way that the Pateau re up because the brand has sort of been brought back in recent years. I just don't really get what it's trying to do. I'm not saying that the sportswear had to be like current sportswear or had to be like a reference to, you know, the 1920s, but this like Emilio Pucci-esque rainbow dress is just kind of weird and I don't really get it and I don't really understand where it's coming from. And if it's supposed to be a reference back to Pateau, like, is it? Because I don't really see that. Uh, I'm not a Pateau expert in any sort of way, any sort of direction, but I'm just not understanding this. At all. Next, let's talk about Hailey Bieber in Saint Laurent. Now, Hailey is a Saint Laurent girl. She pretty much dabbles between Saint Laurent and Bottega Veneta, which all fall under the umbrella of caring, which she is kind of like a caring gal when I think about it now. But she's wearing this off the shoulder scoop neck cat suit that's kind of a capri, but also has like feather little puffs at the end of the sleeves. And in a weird way, I don't really mind it because this is what I expect of Anthony Vaccarello's Saint Laurent. Like it is this very sort of simple and clingy, usually black stuff that, you know, is, it's just there, it exists. I wouldn't say that like the slingback is coming back into fashion anytime soon, but like at the same time, don't quote me on that because I feel like now that I've said it, it's probably gonna come back. But I do find the whole idea of Saint Laurent by Anthony Vaccarello more and more interesting the more that I dive deeply into Yves Saint Laurent's work from, you know, the 70s, 60s, 80s. It does definitely have a feel of trying to modernize those sorts of silhouettes and making it a lot more skin tight, a lot more clingy. But at the same time, I think with Anthony Vaccarello, and I think this moment on Hailey Bieber is a great example of that, there is not the revolutionary aspect that Saint Laurent was known for. The thing is, when you're working under a designer who was revolutionary in his own right and for decades upon decades, it's important that you also then continue that heritage of pushing the boundaries, going over the top, creating something that's never really been seen too much before. And so, in a weird way, I expect that of Anthony Vaccarello's work. And I understand there's a commercial aspect of it. It needs to sell. I get it. But at the same time, I miss seeing the drama, the extravagance, the interesting silhouettes that Anthony was putting out much earlier on in his career. And now it seems like it's all about selling the product, which I get, it's COVID, I understand, but I want a little bit more. But also maybe I shouldn't expect that on Hailey Bieber. Next up is Jennifer Lopez's Valentino Urcouture look that she wore during New Year's Eve. Now this is from that crazy most recent Haute Couture collection that was all on stilts and trapezes. And it's this tiered white ostrich feather coat that is what, maybe 13, 14 feet tall? That is layered almost like stripes of ostrich feathers. It is extravagant, it is over the top, and I think what we talked about with Dua Lipa earlier, where we mentioned the fact that you have these garments that are incredibly long. You have to utilize a platform that will actually highlight them in that way. I think this is a great example of doing that again. These are great garments. They are ridiculous. They are over the top. They are kind of unwearable at certain points or doing certain things, but being able to channel that garment for what it's intended for on a platform that is descending, that showcases the full grandeur of the coat is great. I know that during my New Year's Eve celebration of three people, it was very much so uh, questioned by the not fashion lovers, but I think when you really get to see such an extravagant garment and showcase it to the everyday Joe Schmo watching the whatever New Year's Eve rockin' experience, it's fun, it's different, it's cool, it's kooky, and it's a fashion moment that I think is having a good old time, so I appreciate J-Lo turning it out. As for the headpiece, it's not my favorite moment ever, but like, 
she's trying. She's trying to do face mask vibes. I'll take it. Next up is Jodie Comer and she is wearing Balmain. Now listen, the pagoda shoulder, what am I telling you? 2021, it's, that's its year. Like this is the year to go for a pagoda shoulder if you can wear it. This is a neon yellow pagoda experience that honestly, Olivier Roussong's Bellman is kind of like of the day, modern. It definitely does sort of play on trends. And I don't think this is a terrible style. I think if anybody was gonna do pagoda shoulders in neon, it would probably be Olivier Roussong. And it definitely does reference back to Olivier's very much so comfort zone of the 1980s. In a weird way, the pagoda shoulder almost makes sense with Olivier's work because for the longest time, he's been doing very boxy 80s sort of big shoulder silhouettes. So a natural take or a natural sort of switch up of that gigantic shoulder would be the Bogota shoulder, which probably came out in the 1970s, but still very interesting, very cool. I don't mind it. Then you mix it with a neon yellow, which again, 1980s, it all plays into itself. Honestly, I wish we got to see more of the jacket because I feel like it's probably one of those interesting longer jackets that we saw on more of like an athletic fabric, which I do think Olivier does really, really well. But as of right now, it's giving me very 1980s referential, but modern. I think Jody looks great. I'm enjoying the Balmain Pagoda shoulder. I'm happy with it. Next up is Jonathan Bailey, who is from Bridgerton. Now I know the Bridgerton gals are not exactly happy about the show. Anthony here is wearing Dior Men by Kim Jones. It's just not that exciting. Like I get it. It's a tank top and a nice sort of tailored pant, which like is very gay. It's blah, it's boring, it's sad. Listen, I don't care that it's Dior Men. It's just not in an exciting fabric. It's not really a super duper exciting color. I don't think the shot is even that exciting. It's just, meh. Next up is Casey Musgraves in Gucci. And I'm not really like mad about this cause this feels very 1960s, 1970s sort of style. I think it's definitely Alessandro Michele, but a lot more toned down. I think the color is bright. I think it's, poppy, I think it's interesting. This to me is like cohesive. It's understandable. It definitely has a reference point. It definitely like pushes her out of just being country. The beret, I'll take it, I don't mind it. I think the jacket is actually kind of nice. I like the fact that it's belted. I like that it creates a little bit of a flared out shape. I think the pants are nice. They're a little bit flared as well. And listen, when you see a nice pleat down the front, I'm not gonna complain. The shoes match, and I don't know about this tiny shopping basket, but even that, it's all playing into itself. I really don't mind it. I do think you'd never think it was Gucci if you saw it, but weirdly enough, it's doable for me. Next up is Kerry Washington wearing frame. Listen, I like Kerry Washington in a leather. Like this is what I'm saying is that I think a lot of the times these stylists and these celebrities don't really go out of the box when it comes to fabrication. A nice leather capri set in a button down shirt and nice little short and a nice Big old leather boot is very fun. It has a very 1970s sort of vibe to me. I do think that the color is a nice, gorgeous sort of like milk chocolate. The boots, listen, maybe I would go for something a little bit less stand out-ish in terms of seeing the differentiation between the short and the boot. But at the same time, maybe it's good to be able to see the differentiation between the short and the boot. So we'll leave that one to the experts. But honestly, I just like to see Carrie Washington in like different textiles. I do think it's really fun. I I do think it's really exciting. I do like the cut of it. I really like the length of the short. I feel like capris and, you know, sort of like Bermuda shorts are in for 2021. So I'm about this. I think it's interesting. I think it's fun. Next up is Kim Kardashian in Schiaparelli. Now this is a look that was heard around the world. It was one that was lambasted called She-Hulk, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, everything under the sun. This was just not a beloved look by the everyday person. This is a Scaparelli look and it is a molded corseted bust, which has been another sort of trend that we've seen again and again and again. It dates all the way back to Yves Saint Laurent and Claude Lelong's iconic collaboration in the late 1960s, early 1970s. We saw it from Issey Miyake. We saw it from Alexander McQueen, Tom Ford. Olivier Roustong sort of has recently really like brought it back as well. So there's kind of a lot of places to see this sort of style been done before. And the whole idea of the six pack has been done before by Alexander McQueen as well. But 
Daniel Roseberry Scaparelli, I honestly think, was trying to bring back the idea of the surrealist collaboration between Elsa Scaparelli and artists like Salvador Dali. Listen, I'm not really that mad about it because I do think it's definitely trying, it's trying to say something. I personally think that it's regarding the ideas of the body and the sort of expectations that we as like Western society have on what the body should look like and how fit it should be. And I think Kim Kardashian is also a very good example of the idea of whether or not she's modified her body or whether or not she works out or her waist and her butt and all of these sorts of things. So to me, it sort of has a deeper meaning that I think should be looked at. I don't think the deeper meaning is necessarily going on in the sarong you know, silky skirt just tied around her waist. That I think, weirdly enough, Tom Ford couldn't figure out, but Olivia Roussong at Balmain could. So I don't think this is a great sort of skirt moment. I don't think it highlights the bust in any particular way. And I think it's a little bit disappointing. Uh, I'm not a jewelry expert either, but I can't deny that those earrings look like eggplants with snakes on them. And like, you know, that's just what it looks like. Overall though, I understand where people are coming from that they don't like it, they don't think it's interesting, they think it's really weird, but at the same time, if you don't actually understand the referential points where throughout history, or at least throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, this sort of style has come up again and again and again, you probably wouldn't really care, wouldn't really want to understand it. I don't think the style is revolutionary, I do think that it's probably some sort of little take on the idea of the body and how we think about it in the Western world. I don't know if it's a fully realized enough look to have that thought process come through in the way that I'm sure Daniel Roseberry and Kim Kardashian wanted it to. Next up is Kylie Jenner in Bottega Veneta. See, listen, I'm working on it. In this red sequined dress by Daniel Lee, which honestly, the more and more that I see Daniel Lee's work, or at least the most recent collection, the more and more I'm like, hmm. And something else that I've come to notice is that Kylie Jenner seems to be a big client of Bottega. I do think that Daniel Lee's reach in terms of influencers and all of that has really pushed his accessories to the height and the top of the heap in terms of luxury brands. And I'm sure that Bottega has become a real moneymaker for caring, where before it probably wasn't really a gigantic player in that sense. I think that I've actually even seen Kylie Jenner wearing custom Bottega Veneta before. So even in that regard, they do seem to have some sort of working relationship in that manner, which is interesting. The sequin dress, it's not really that exciting. It does look like it fits her really, really nicely. It almost looks like it was sort of like poured on her, which I enjoy. I do think that, that works out. I do think it looks decent enough. It's an all red dress for Christmas. I get it. It's nothing super duper special, but Again, I'd like to see where that relationship between Bottega and Kylie Jenner goes in the future because I do think it's something that probably will keep on keeping on. Next up is Lily Collins in Celine. And now listen, I am not an Eddie Slaman Celine person at all. It just, eh. it's grown on me because I understand what it is, but at the same time, it's just blah. But like something about this look, I don't hate it. I kind of like it. It's like 1970s lady, kind of shabby chic. That's what it is. It kind of works. I get it. I'm not really mad about it. I don't think it's trying to be something that it's not. And I feel like maybe at this point, that's what Eddie Slim and Celine is. It's not trying to be something that it's not. It is nicely made clothes that they got from some sort of fucking vintage store redid the patterns and said, listen, we'll do it in nicer fabrics. And that's what you get here. You get a ruffly down little dress. You get a nice sort of knee length style. It's not crazy. It's not ridiculous. It's not wonderful and it's not amazing, but it's not terrible and it's not hideous at the same time. So it's just middle of the road. I'll take it. I'm not really mad about it. When I see a nice seventies look, I'm happy about it. Next up is Miley Cyrus wearing Paco Rabanne. Now Paco Rabanne is an icon of the space age era and his chainmail styles are definitely ones that I still love to this day. And Julian DeSena, who is currently the creative director, has definitely upped the ante in terms of the chainmail styles. And this Miley Cyrus dress, which seems to have some sort of handkerchief cut, is definitely exciting and it's full of hearts, which again, I do think the way that Julian DeSena has sort of brought motifs into these chainmail pieces is really exciting and different and cool and a way to sort of make these pieces much more desirable to the everyday person. Obviously, I don't think the everyday person is wearing chainmail, but you know, 
why not try? Obviously we can't really see how it looks and how it fits totally on Miley at this point because she's sitting down. But from the torso up, it definitely does look like it fits, which I think with chainmail is kind of hard to do. Or at least, you know, making sure that when you're buying chainmail, you want to make sure it fits, but sometimes it's a little bit baggy because it's not exactly like a fabric that sticks to the body. It's its own whole sort of textile that creates its own shape, creates its own silhouettes, and is hard to necessarily like nail down. Honestly, I think Miley has definitely been having some pretty solid fashion moments as of recent. And I think this is just a nice little drop in the bucket for her. I like the relationship that she has with Paco Rabanne and I hope that that continues because that actually could be really fun and different. And I'd love to see her in those like full chainmail hoods during a performance, that would be great. Next up is Mindy Kaling and she is wearing Monse, which is the brand run by Fernando Garcia and Laura Kim. Now, I actually do enjoy Monse. It's sort of like New York deconstruction, reconstruction sort of styles. It is definitely interesting. And that has bled into Oscar de la Renta, which is the brand that the two also creative direct as well. I actually like Mindy taking a little bit of fashion risk. I like the idea of her in a deconstruction sort of style, but this sweater, it looks like all the water and the lock sort of rose up and now all the boats are here. And I don't like that. I do know that this sweater is supposed to be a little bit off the shoulder, which sort of adds to the asymmetrical and sort of deconstructed style of Monse. And so the fact that Mindy is wearing it just sort of normally, I don't think is very helpful. I'm also not obsessed with the Gucci belt. I do like that she took a risk. I like that she's wearing brands like Monse, but I'd love to see her in like a beautifully cut Monse suit with like some sort of crazy sleeve and a little bit of like a cut out here and a little bit of like a extra asymmetry down here. That could actually be really, really fun. So let's get that going, Mindy, because you're on the money. It's close, but no cigar in this regard. Next up is Monica. And now I got dragged from heaven to hell for not knowing who Monica is, but I do know that Monica is serving at the fuck up in Burberry right now. This trench coat is amazing. Listen, I probably dragged the shit out of it on the runway and that's fine, but Monica is giving it to me right now. Like she's giving it to me. She said, you're a little bitch. You're really annoying. I don't like that. Here's this Burberry coat. Don't talk shit about Ricardo Tisci ever again. And I'm sort of saying, okay. I love the fur that's pouring off the shoulders and sleeves of this coat. I do think that it's a different way to sort of go about bringing a trench. And weirdly enough, I think when you think of a trench, you think of like the rain. You don't often think of the cold. So in a weird way, this is made out of some sort of wool, it seems, which is a very warm fiber. And adding the fur sort of then elevates that idea of this style being for the cold. I love this little tiny baby, turtlenecky, silky, ribbony top that's going on. It just adds that nice little offbeat of beige into that brown. I'm not even really mad about the, the Burberry gloves. They're kind of fun, they're kind of cute. And the boots, not obsessed, but at the same time, I think the rest of the look really elevates it. And when I look at the color of the boot against the color of the brown on the gloves, they sort of play into each other. So this is fucking great. I love this. If this is what Ricardo Tisci like gives more often, I'd be really happy about it. I'd be really much more excited about it. Next up is Reggae Jean Page, who is the, I was gonna say delicious Duke of Hastings, but that might be a little bit too forward, wearing L'Envon. Now, L'Envon has sort of been out of the game for quite some time. I mean, like it's in the game, but you know, nobody really talks about its game. This is just like a really nice blue cut suit. It's nothing crazy, it's nothing ridiculous. And I do think that when you add whatever these like squiggles are, pins, roaches, that are dramatic on the lapels. It adds just like a tiny little bit of excitement, a tiny little bit of interest, a little bit of wonder. And listen, I'm not really trying to, I mean, I am trying to see Reggae Jean Page in like exciting looks. I am, I hope that that happens in the future. But right now he's just starting out. It's a beautifully cut suit. It has a really interesting little detail or two on the lapels and he looks great. So you know what? First outing, I'm taking it, I'm running with it, I'm happy about it. Next up is Regina King in Louis Vuitton and I love this. I love this suit. It is so cool, it is so exciting. Now, to me, this print, this motif is probably a reference back to like the 1980s, which we have seen multiple times from Nicolas Jesquier. He definitely did do that sort of like, you know those paper cups that you like 
put water in at the dentist. That's what I think is happening here. It's just taken all of the color out of it and given it much more of like a monochromatic sort of feel. And it just feels very space age. It feels very exciting. It feels very different, but it still seems very wearable. It's, I like the fact that we're getting the little arc like sneaker underneath as well. It's just a nice look. The motif is interesting, but it's not overpowering. I think the cuts on the sweater and the pants definitely have references back to the 1980s, which Jaskier likes to do. And overall, I think Regina just looks really cool and casual and easy peasy, but it's still fashion. It's still exciting. It's still different. And I'm happy to see that. And I'd like to see more of that in the future from Louis Vuitton. Regina King is killing it. Next up is Rosalia and she is wearing Iris Van Herpen. Now I know people are gonna be like, we already saw this dress. I don't give a f Sorry, I don't give a singular F. If I see a beautiful garment that has been worn by multiple people multiple times and it's still a beautiful garment and it's shot beautifully and it still looks good, why am I gonna be mad about it? We're all about sustainability. We're all about re-wearing. We're all about fashion being much more green. This is green. It's the same sample. It's been over and over and over, worn again and again and again. And listen, as much as I'd like to see, you know, more samples get more airtime, I'm not mad about it. It's this beautiful three-dimensional pleat. Like, I don't even know how this woman does it. It's almost like the pleat sort of comes up. And that's the thing about Iris Van Herpen that's so exciting is that everybody does pleats and sometimes they look great. Sometimes they look boring. But Iris Van Herpen, she does pleats and then it's like wacky and weird and it makes you think like, should fabrics now in the 21st century become much more three-dimensional? Does it always have to lay flat? Should it evolve in that way? And that's what I'm thinking here. I think the ombre is beautiful. I can't see any sort of lining or sheerness or fabrication that is different. I think it's a really, really beautiful dress. I think it's a dress that you could stare at for hours. I like the fact that it's sort of cocktail-y. I like the fact that it has not like sleeves, but little armholes that you have to put your arms out of, which might be kind of uncomfortable, but like you're wearing an Iris Van Herpen creation. Who cares if it's uncomfortable? You're wearing it. Be grateful. Honestly, I think she looks great. I think this is a great little moment for her. I'm happy about it. And I want to see more Iris Van Herpen in the future. Next up is Rosé and she is wearing Saint Laurent. Now she is very much so a Saint Laurent woman. And listen, the pinstripe jacket with the little sort of I want to say it's a pussy bow blouse, but it's not because I feel like you have to tie it a certain way for it to be a pussy bow blouse. But this sort of double tie blouse is interesting. The chain belt and the striped pants, you know, I'm not really mad about either. The, the big flower that's like strangling her, I think that could definitely go. We don't need that. That ridiculous, over the top, dramatic, and for nothing. Like sometimes ridiculous, over the top, dramatic is great. This is not that case. I do think that the sharp shoulder sort of brings in that 1980s sort of feel. I do like the fact that it's suiting. Saint Laurent made a beautiful suit. He definitely helped to revolutionize the idea of the suit for a woman with his the smoking suit. I like the fact that we have a striped jacket, which isn't really super duper crazy anymore at this point. I just, I feel like it's been done again and again and again. But I do like the fact that there is a stripe on this pan. It definitely does not match the jacket. It's totally different, but it does have a stripe, which sort of correlates in with the jacket, which I'm really not mad about. And I do think, again, that sort of blouse, it's not really super exciting, but the sort of tie shape of the two little ribbons at the end of it are different. I don't really see those super duper often. So, you you know, I'm interested in it. It's not the best thing in the entire world. It's also not the worst thing in the entire world. I want to see more. Next up is Shea Coulee in Valentino and like, oh God, I love this. It's just a beautiful sort of like knit floral motif that's full of color. Listen, I'm not obsessed with this big old rock stud bag. No offense, Valentino. It's just not my favorite thing in the entire world. I do like the fact that she added her own floral head crown. It adds excitement. It adds a little bit more, you know, drama. It adds a little bit more like queeniness too, which I think when it's a drag queen, just a little bit of camp always helps. Honestly, I do think it's a really, really nice sort of moment. I wish the bag was sort of taken out of it and just this knit, beautiful cape, poncho, dress, whatever this is was shown more, but honestly being able to see all of like the detail, the little quilting of it is just beautiful, sexy, wonderful. Valentino's ready to wear doesn't have as much work put into it as the haute couture, I presume, but from this you can obviously tell that there's quite a lot of work put into the ready to wear, so. I'm happy about it. And I like seeing Shea Coulee and Valentino. I hope to see more of that in the future. Next up is Sophia Carson wearing Prada. 
it's it's not good. And then I say to myself, what's well, Prada? It's not always meant to be like good, but this is, just, it, it's not, it's really not good. The flowers of the shoulders, the crescendoing of the, the cascading pearls that fall down the front, the fact that it's fringe and I can see the cuts in it to where the fringe, it's just, it's not well done in my opinion. It just doesn't look like it's, you know, beautifully done. I'm sure that a lot of work and time and effort and energy went into it, absolutely, but it just doesn't look good. And I understand if Prada doesn't want it to look good and that's sort of the vibe and that's what we're going for, but it's just not pretty. It's not attractive. It's not exciting. And I actually think Sophia Carson for the most part definitely does like deliver on some good looks. This is not one of those good looks. Next up is Taylor Swift in Zimmerman. And honestly, I'm not really mad about this. For me, at least Taylor Swift definitely like she does her own thing in Stella McCartney a lot. And I don't really think that that's the brand placement that Taylor Swift needs. I think Taylor Swift in a Zimmerman, in a Brock collection, in a Rodarte, those sorts of brands that definitely have a simplistic sort of old world, sort of like white girl aesthetic is good for her. I don't think that's necessarily like a bad thing. I think it's almost like when, you know, people are saying white girls, don't put your hair in box braids because it doesn't look good. It's gonna rip your hair out. It's not great. Do your hair like Farrah Fawcett in the 1980s. Like do that. It looks great. It looks beautiful. I think that that's what I kind of want for Taylor Swift. I'm not saying that she's been cultural appropriating at all, but when she definitely taps into her sort of like folklore-y, old world-y, cottage core -y sort of style, I think it makes sense. It's on brand. I can't be mad about that. You know what I mean? Like brands like Batsheva, you know, give me old Calvin Klein when Rap Simmons was there and was doing sort of the cut out sort of styles where you get a little bit of side boob on your prairie dress like give me that that's exciting that's cool that's fun i actually think this dress is kind of nice i like the lace it's definitely old worldy i like the fact that it sort of is asymmetrical and descends in an asymmetry sort of style not obsessed with the bow on the side that could go but for the most part i don't think it's the worst thing in the entire world this is what i expect of taylor swift and the more and more that she taps into this and the more and more she works with designers like a zimmerman I think the more and more that her aesthetic will, at least fashion wise, grow into the aesthetic and musical talents that she provides. So you know what? If this is what I get from Taylor Swift, I can be happy about it. I can make that work. I'd like to see her tap more into the sort of old worldy, European-y, whitey styles because I think it'll suit her. And I don't think it's a bad thing that it would suit her. Next up is Tessa Thompson, and I'm so happy with this because Tessa Thompson has killed it. Like, she's killing it. It's so great to see. She's wearing this Burberry pleated experience, which is off the runway. Now, it's this some sort of like polo rugby-ish shirt that is full of pleats, it says something on it that I can't read, don't care enough to read, but I just, I just love the pleats. I think it's beautiful, I think it's stunning. And then you take this big old long skirt that has these beautiful sort of frilled at the bottom, which is almost like a lettuce hem sort of take, and it's full of pleats too. It's just really hot, it's really wonderful, and it's really sexy, and yet she still sort of like keeps this gothic vibe with it, which I think is very Ricardo Tichy. I mean, when you look at the Givenchy, it is very dark, it is very gothic, which I don't think is a bad thing to tap into. And I like the fact that her pose, her hair, the makeup all sort of seems to like channel that. I love the little neck tie thing and I like the fact that it matches the cuffs and I think that that sort of plays into the athletic vibe that again Ricardo Tichy has consistently time after time after time tapped into whether it was at Givenchy or whether it's at Burberry. I like it. I think it's fun. I think it's different. I think it's exciting and I want to see more of this. Finally let's talk about Yara Shahidi and she is wearing this JW Anderson look and I think she looks great. I think it's super fun. I think it's super different. J.W. Anderson is weird and wacky and over the top and strange and crazy. And this suit is brilliant. Like this blazer is gorgeous. It fits her phenomenally. I love the cutout on the inner sleeve, which allows it to sort of drape itself as she moves, which I think brings such an interesting sort of femininity to a suit, which is usually much more masculine in a certain sense. I do like the oversized pants. I do think it makes sense. I do think it adds that sort of baggy oversized silhouette that we do know from JW Anderson. And 
these sort of, I want to call it like a half skirt. I want to call it like a swag of this green fabric. I do think adds, you know, a little bit of a different silhouette. I do think that it adds almost like a Christmas tree sort of shape, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's different. I think it's exciting. I'm not obsessed with the, the icy blue belt. I do sort of wish that maybe the belt was in black. It just would blend in more and it would allow the, the waist to sort of do its thing naturally. But overall, I think she looks stunning in this. I think this is beautifully shot. I think it's beautifully tailored. I think that it adds in masculine and feminine elements in ways that we don't normally see and are a little bit more subtle, but really, really smart. So hats off to Yara Shahidi and JW Anderson for this moment. So that is the end of our December 2020 roast video. Please let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. I'd love to know your best and worst outfits. As for me, Hmm. I have to give it to Regina King and Louis Vuitton. It's just different. It's exciting. It's definitely a more athletic sort of style from Nicolas Jasquier. And I think that Regina King just carries it so well. It's just really cool and suave and interesting. As for the worst, I got to give it to Sophia Carson in that Prada. It's, it's, it's rough. It's not good. It's not exciting. I can't even see the sort of ugly chic aspect of it because I see the ugly, I don't see the sheep. But I'd love to know your guys' best and worst looks of the month. Please let me know. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYL.